December 6, 1917. The Great War is raging in much of the Eurasian continent, nearly entering its fourth year. The magnitude of death and destruction is beyond anything humanity has ever witnessed before. The advent of high explosives in the late 19th century has completely revolutionized the destructiveness of warfare. But on the other side of the world, in the quiet little Canadian port of Halifax, the largest man-made bomb ever devised this far was slowly sailing into port. It was about to become one of the greatest disasters in Canadian history. By 1917, the war in Europe had reached a fevered pitch. Intense trench warfare marred the conflict. New technology was developed constantly to better kill the enemy. Aircraft became a major player, and high explosives were used in massive abundance. Ships constantly streamed across the Atlantic, fueling the Allied war machine. But this was when the mighty German U-boat began to take effect, assailing Allied supply lines and making the already difficult trip a living nightmare. Halifax, Nova Scotia became a vital port to the Allies. The deepwater port remained largely ice-free throughout the year. The location of a few islands near the mouth made it extremely defensible, especially with the installation of submarine nets early on in the war. It became a perfect stopping off point for convoys traveling from North America to Europe. The once quiet, rustic town of Halifax became a booming port town. Its harbor well suited for a staging point for convoys. The protected harbor of Bedford Basin lay beyond a tight mouth called the Narrows, just 1,000 feet wide, or 304 meters. They were protected from the elements, and the basin itself was deep and wide, good for anchoring ships waiting to be fueled and queuing up for a convoy. 20 to 30 ships would group up at a time before being escorted across the Atlantic by ships of the Royal Navy. Despite Halifax being a relatively small and quiet town of about 60,000 people, its useful position would see its population soar. In just one month, as many as 15,000 troops had shipped out of Halifax. Several rail lines kept a steady stream of supplies and coal streaming into Bedford Basin to be shipped overseas to aid the war effort. But our tragedy doesn't begin in Halifax, but instead, New York. On the 9th of November, the SS Mont Blanc, a 320-foot or 97-meter tramp steamer, sailed into New York after completing a long and treacherous trip from Bordeaux, France. The ship was nothing impressive. Built in 1899 by Sir Relton Dixon & Company of Middleborough in northern Yorkshire, she had already lived a long and neglectful life. Used to haul ore for several different companies, the ship was run constantly and maintained very little. Her triple expansion engine could scarcely push her along at a meager seven knots. Now, pardon my pronunciation here, but when it was bought by the Company Générale Transatlantique, or the French line in 1915, it wasn't much to look at. Too small and too slow for most jobs, the company simply put its money in thinking the French government would be hiring just about anything that could float and carry goods at the time. They bet correctly as the Mont Blanc was quickly contracted to haul supplies across the Atlantic. The Mont Blanc was 3,279 gross registered tons and 320 feet or 97 meters in length. She was 44 feet or 13 meters at the beam and had roughly a 15 foot or 4 meter draft. It was powered by one triple expansion steam engine and propelled by a single screw. During her service in the Great War, she was outfitted with two guns fore and aft for general defense during transatlantic crossings. On this November day, her new captain brought her into port. Once more, pardon my French, uh, my pronunciation isn't that great. For Captain Amy Joseph Marie Lamedec, this had been his first crossing aboard Mont Blanc. The 38-year-old captain had been at sea for 22 of those years. He had achieved his captain's papers just two years prior. But he was seen as a skilled and very by-the-book mariner. But quickly the crew realized this would not be a by-the-book trip. They were ordered by the French Admiralty to bypass their usual New York dock and proceed on to Gravesend Bay in Brooklyn. While in Gravesend Bay, the Mont Blanc was descended upon by a small army of shipwrights who proceeded to practically rebuild the ship's cargo hold. Every bulkhead and deck space was covered in wood, cloth, tar, and rubber. Small partition compartments were made of wood and even fastened together with copper nails. All of this occurred before a small rotation of police started to guard the ship, ensuring no one was on or off without them knowing. These things only helped confirm the growing fears of the crew, which were soon realized as stevedores began to load the volatile cargo onto the Mont Blanc. So what was in that cargo? 62 tons of gun cotton, a compound used in place of gunpowder in firing artillery. 
250 tons of TNT, a well-known high explosive, and 2,366 tons of picric acid. And at this time, lesser known but even more volatile high explosive. The flashing point of TNT being around 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The flash point for picric acid is only around 572 degrees. Thus, the point of all the partitions and sparkless fittings was to keep any sparks out of the volatile cargo. The crew were even forbidden from carrying matches while on board. So once the Mont Blanc was fully loaded, she came out to around 3 kilotons of TNT, about a fifth of the yield of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima several decades later. A volatile cargo, to say the least. But when packed safely in the hold with its wooden compartments and sparkless fittings, a relatively safe cargo. Nothing short of a massive jolt or an out-of-control fire could detonate it. Confusingly, the stevedores received a last-minute order from the French government. There was still room aboard Mont Blanc, so they ordered the onloading of 494 barrels of benzol. Benzol was a newly created coal tar product made of benzene and toluene. It had many uses, but during World War I, it was used mostly for motor fuel. One thing was well known about it, it was highly flammable. The barrels were stacked wherever there was room, inside the cargo hold and even on deck where they could be three or four barrels high. While the TNT and picric acid was fastened down tight, the barrels were more slapdash, with thin canvas straps over stacks of barrels. It was a more rushed job for what seemed like a less hazardous cargo. But with flammable benzol over high explosives, in essence they had simply added the fuse to the world's biggest bomb up to that point. High explosives had a very high ignition temperature, but surrounded by fuel, they now had the means to achieve just that. On December 1st, the Mont Blanc was fully loaded and ready to depart for Europe. Captain Le Medec would meet with the British Admiralty. They were responsible for organizing the convoys that crossed the Atlantic. The liaison asked if the Mont Blanc could maintain a speed of just eight knots. Le Medec, who was still new to the ship, consulted his logs and was remiss to say she probably could not. The officer was, of course, concerned. A convoy could only go the speed of its slowest ship. The Mont Blanc would be slowing down an entire convoy. So he ordered the ship to sail unescorted to Halifax, Nova Scotia. There her fate would be left in the hands of the convoy officer. If he determined she could not keep up, Captain Le Medec was given a secret alternate route in an envelope to open and follow should the need arise. So the Mont Blanc would depart its entire crew on edge. They slowly sailed north, hugging the American and Canadian shore, trying desperately to fight through a storm that blew in from the west. Each wave they plowed through felt like it would detonate the powder keg they now stood upon. Sleep was light and fitful for all aboard during that few days' journey. Meanwhile, plying its way across the North Atlantic, bound for the same port of Halifax, was the SS Imo. This Norwegian registered whaling factory ship had ceased its whaling duties for a far more humanitarian duty. It was chartered by the Belgian Relief Commission to carry vital supplies and humanitarian aid across the Atlantic to the beleaguered region of Europe. Being a neutral nation and a humanitarian duty, it was believed that it would be unmolested by German U-boats. But just to ensure this, a large Belgian relief in large 10-foot tall letters was painted across the sides, just in case. Built in 1889 in Belfast, Ireland, the 5,043-ton freighter was already fairly past its prime. 430 feet or 131 meters in length, with a 45-foot or 13-meter beam and a 30-foot or 9-meter draft. With her single triple expansion engine, she could produce about 424 nominal horsepower, pushing her along at 12 knots, nearly double the Mont Blanc. At the time, she was heading from Rotterdam for Halifax, ballasted down her final destination being New York for supplies to bring back to Europe. At the command of IMO was 47-year-old Norwegian captain Hakon Frome. With nearly 30 years of experience on the sea, Frome was an accomplished and skilled mariner. He was steely-eyed and focused, but he was well known for his impatience and even bouts of rage. On a previous trip to Philadelphia, the IMO docked to receive repairs to the ship's engine and boiler. The repairs were performed by Schmal Engineering Works. They took 10 days and the company owner quoted it at about $9,000, well over $200,000 USD in today's currency. But when Gustav Schmal came to collect his payment for a job well done, Captain Fraum refused to pay and refused to elaborate upon why. Schmal, frustrated at this, departed and returned with his attorney. 
but this still didn't cause the tight-fisted Fromm to budge. When the attorney departed to repair legal papers, Fromm fell into a fit of rage. Schmau recounts, he acted like a maniac. Fromm glared at me like a man out of his mind and snarled like a beast. Raising his big fists, he brought them down on my head, knocking me to the floor. Then cursing horribly, he picked me up bodily and hurled me through the door of the cabin. As soon as I regained my feet, I ran for my life. After that, Fromm unmoored his repaired yet unpaid for IMO and fled. He sailed down the Delaware until Schmau's attorney and the U.S. Marshals caught up with the IMO with a tugboat. Now Fromm wasn't just fixed with the $9,000 for the repair, but an additional $11,000 for his assault and flight. No explanation was ever offered for his actions except from his own attorney that stated Fromm was deeply anti-German. Gustav Schmau, of course, being of German ancestry. Norway, despite being neutral in the present conflict, had suffered greatly to German torpedoes and mines, leaving a deep resentment for the country in the hearts of many Norwegian mariners. So despite being a competent and capable mariner, Captain Fraum was short-tempered and impatient. So you can imagine the captain's great displeasure upon arriving in Halifax and hearing he'd have to wait for an inspection, as well as having to wait to receive bunkering. The vital convoy ships in the harbor taking precedence over his neutral relief ship. The Mont Blanc finished her 850-mile journey northwest through storm and gale, arriving outside Halifax Harbor on the 5th of December. They steamed for an examination anchorage outside McNabb's Island as a Royal Canadian Navy tugboat steamed out to meet them. They were arriving just at sunset, darkness falling as a harbor tug deposited one of Halifax's harbor pilots aboard. Hopping aboard was 45-year-old Haligonian Francis Mackey, the pilot had been to sea since he was a mere 12 years old, and became an apprentice pilot at just 21, gaining his master's papers in 1899. By 1917, Mackey had been guiding ships into the port of Halifax for 24 years. Captain Lemedek and Francis Mackey greeted one another, Lemedek's English only barely passable. The pair retired to the captain's cabin, where Mackey learned, with some dismay, just what the Mont Blanc was hauling. It made little difference to his job as a pilot, but of course he was set on edge knowing he'd be piloting a massive bomb into Halifax. Mackey then tried to explain with great difficulty that the ship would likely have to stay out of the harbor until morning. The submarine nets strung across the mouth of the harbor would be lifted into place for the night. He finally got his point across as the Canadian Navy ship inspector climbed aboard to speak with the captain and check his manifest before departing for the night. That Wednesday night, Mont Blanc would sit anchored near the McNabb's Island Lighthouse, waiting for dawn. Aboard Captain Le Medec, pilot Francis McKay, and the officers of the Mont Blanc sat and ate dinner and had some coffee as they made an attempt at conversation. McKay produced some cigars, offering them to the others who looked at him with concern before the captain firmly stated, Non, il est interdict de fumier. No smoking on the ship. The following morning, Thursday, the 6th of December, the anti-submarine nets were lowered as Mont Blanc received the signal to proceed north towards Halifax to her temporary berthing in Bedford Basin. At 7.50, she lifted anchor. It was just a 90-minute trip, then she would anchor for the day, then proceed east across the Atlantic with a convoy this time the following morning. Typically, with her hazardous cargo, the Mont Blanc would display the Bravo flag, a red flag with a swallow tail to denote that she had hazardous cargo on board. But due to it being wartime, this protocol was often waived, the flag only being good for showing the enemy exactly which ship in a convoy will make the biggest boom. As Mont Blanc started her morning trip northbound to Bedford Basin, the IMO was on a reciprocal course. She had finished her bunkering the night before, but was too late to get underway for New York, much to the chagrin of Captain Fraum. But in the morning of the 6th, the IMO pulled the hook. It was now underway and steaming south out of Bedford Basin and into the Narrows. Acting as the pilot on this outbound trip was harbor pilot William Hayes. The 43-year-old was born near to Halifax just as his comrade Francis McKay was. In fact, both were very close friends. Both were extremely skilled mariners, Hayes having over two decades of experience under his belt. Both ships appearing to be in very good hands as they began their morning transits. The IMO heading south to open ocean, and then New York, the Mont Blanc north into Bedford Basin. But the IMO's trip south through the Narrows would not go uninterrupted. We know this because I'm doing a video about the disaster that ensued from it. At around 8.15, the IMO entered the narrow channel to their starboard side of the channel, 
Halifax to their right and Dartmouth to their left, on the far side of the Narrows. They were traveling at a good clip, around seven knots, fairly fast for inside the harbor. But upon entering the channel, they were met with a tramp steamer, the SS Clara, steaming upwards towards them, also on the starboard side of the channel. Typically, this was seen as poor seamanship, the rules dictating that you should favor the side of the channel that laid to your starboard. Hayes, a bit irritated with the Clara's departure to the rules, signaled on the ship's whistle one short blast. This indicated that he wished to pass to the port of Clara, a subtle hint for the steamer to move towards the correct side of the channel. Adamantly, Clara answered with two short blasts, indicating she wished to pass the IMO to her starboard and keeping to the wrong side of the channel. Hayes was irritated, but in a hurry. He answered the signal with two short as well and adjusted his course to port, putting the IMO more towards the center of the narrow channel and nearer to the wrong side of the channel. Further down the channel, upbound to Bedford Basin, was an ex-Navy gunboat turned tug, the 125-foot Stella Marais. She was towing two barges, also heading for Bedford Basin. She was moving at an almost standstill pace, right in the center of the channel, much to the irritation of Pilot Hayes. He decided once more to signal two short blasts on the whistle and come more to port and more to the wrong side of the channel. The slow Stella Marais begrudgingly agreed and also came to port. The captain of the tugboat, afraid that should he come to starboard instead, his cables or barges may get overrun by the much faster IMO. So it came to be that the IMO was downbound at high speed on the wrong side of the channel, just as the Mont Blanc was entering the channel in the opposite direction, on the correct side of the channel. Spotting IMO blaring down the wrong side of the channel, Captain Le Medec and Pilot McKay on the much slower Mont Blanc initiated the standard one short blast whistle signal before steering to starboard and slowing her engines. They inched closer to the already very close Dartmouth shore, but IMO didn't return the signal, Pilot Hayes instead returning a too short blast signal. He was already so far to the port side of the channel, it would be pointless to come to starboard for him. Neither the pilot nor Captain Fraum had any idea they were playing chicken with a floating bomb. Once more the Mont Blanc signaled her intentions to come to starboard, and once more IMO signaled the intentions of coming to port. The vessels were creeping closer. On this course, they would surely hit each other. Even if Mont Blanc somehow missed the IMO, she'd likely run aground on the Dartmouth shore. But Captain Le Medec was in a game of chicken now. If he suddenly changed course at the same time as IMO, they would still hit. But it was his only option. He ordered course change to port, the helmsman feverishly whipping the wheel to port, the bow slowly turning. Just as it seemed the two ships may just scrape past one another, the IMO made one final fatal mistake. Either Captain Fraum or Pilot Hayes ordered the IMO into a stern propulsion, signaling this with three short blasts on the whistle. The speeding IMO slowed down considerably, but there was one glaring issue with how single screw ships react to a stern propulsion. Instead of simply stopping and backing straight like a car, it often causes the ship to twist in the rotational direction of the screw. So as the IMO slowed, her stern began to swing to port as her bow swung starboard. Now, as the Mont Blanc looked as though she may clear the IMO, the IMO's bow swung into the middle of the channel, right into the path of the floating bomb. McKay saw this all occurring as if in slow motion. He yelled out, there's going to be a collusion, full speed astern. Hayes on the IMO yelling something similar, but it was far too little, far too late. As the ships slowed, their bows aligned, and the two ships collided bow to bow at 8.46 a.m. Had it been any other ship, this collision would not have been noteworthy. The IMO sustained little if any real damage. The Mont Blanc's hull was punctured down to the waterline and up to the main deck, but was still floating just fine. Any other ship, and the worst that would have occurred is a battle of two insurance companies over who was at fault and who would pay whom. But the Mont Blanc was carrying the world's largest bomb. As the IMO's bow sliced into the Mont Blanc, they successfully avoided hitting the center of the ship, loaded with her picric acid, gun cotton, and TNT, but instead hit several stacks of benzol. The precariously stacked barrels having their lashings snapped as they toppled and broke open, spilling the volatile fuel everywhere. Fuel ran down the decks and pooled in the hull. All that was needed was one spark, which the IMO eagerly provided. Still operating a stern propulsion, the ship pulled away from its stricken counterpart, steel grinding on steel as they separated, showering the fuel-soaked deck with sparks that immediately ignited the benzol. A wisp of black smoke snaked up from the hold, 
that slowly grew into a full-blown fire on the bow, engulfing and spreading slowly. The crew of the IMO were sluggish in their response to the collision, but Mont Blanc's was not. Having spent the better part of a week in fear of exactly what had just occurred, the crew on deck retreated to the pilot house as the flames on the bows spread into an inferno. Had the fire been anywhere else, there may have been something they could do, but as it was, the ship's only fire pump was located on the bow. Even if they wanted to anchor to keep the ship in the middle of the harbor, both of the anchors were located on the bow. The next option would have been to scuttle the ship, but the Mont Blanc was old and poorly maintained. It would take up to a half hour to open the valves to begin scuttling the ship, then nearly two hours for her to actually sink. While this process would take hours, they had only minutes. Now, it's easy for you or I to imagine what we do in this situation as a reader or a viewer. It's simple for us to opine and explain what heroic deeds we'd perform to save the day. For a brief moment, Francis Mackey considered turning the Mont Blanc south, pinning the throttle down and steaming out of the harbor. The inflow of water from the bow could likely slow the spreading fire, maybe he could even douse it. But should the vessel detonate in a minute or so, he'd have saved no one and only succeeded in killing himself. It's easy to say you'd be the hero, but unless you were there, in Pilot Mackey's shoes, you'd never know. The pilot gave the order to the mustard crew. Look to your boats. The crew needed little coaxing as they ran for the two lifeboats, thankfully located at the stern of the ship. Captain Lamedic agreed with the order, laying below to notify the engineers of the order. But when it came time for the captain himself to step off, he was harder to persuade insisting on several occasions that he would stay with the burning ship. He finally needed to be convinced by his crew to depart the doomed vessel. All the while, the rest of the crew sat in their boats, sweating next to the burning bomb of a ship, waiting for their order to depart. The entire front end of Mont Blanc was engulfed in flames by now, as fires burned out of control on the hold. In a final act, Le Medec locked the ship's helm in place to keep the ship from spinning erratically as she drifted. But slowly, the burning vessel was drifting towards the Halifax piers, specifically Pier 6. With the crew loaded in the lifeboats, the two boats made for the nearby Dartmouth shore, shouting to anyone that would listen that the Mont Blanc was loaded with explosives. Yet few would listen, many too dumbfounded by the burning ship to worry about the crazed rowing Frenchmen fleeing their burning ship. In Halifax, the day was just beginning, the sleepy port town heading off to their Thursday workdays. Some at the sugar refinery nearby, others to the ships in the port. Hundreds of Halifax's school children headed to school, their school days delayed from 9 a.m. to 9.30 for the winter months, giving the schools time to heat up the boilers and the sun to rise. Word of the burning ship in the harbor spread fast, the plume of black acrid smoke visible from all over town. Crowds began to gather on the shore as the inferno grew on the ship. None were the wiser that the vessel was packed to the gills with six million pounds of explosives. Even as barrels of benzol exploded and were sent flying hundreds of feet into the air, none seemed to be largely concerned, nor could they have anticipated just how catastrophic the event was about to be. Though the town didn't simply sit back and enjoy the show, several vessels moved in close to the burning ship to attempt to render aid. A small boat was dispatched from the nearby cruiser HMS High Flyer to see what could be done. The tug Stella Murray, after anchoring her two barges, returned to try and render aid as well attempting to hook up towing cables to the burning ship, which at this time had drifted onto Pier 6 and was lighting the wooden pier ablaze. On shore, a fire alarm was pulled as nervous shopkeepers used their telephones to call the local fire stations. Multiple fire stations responded, including one which had the first motorized fire engine in the city. Firefighters speeding towards Pier 6 to attempt to fight the blaze burning out of control. The Mont Blanc now nearly entirely engulfed as the clock struck 9 a.m. On the Dartmouth shore, the crew of the Mont Blanc reached shore with their lifeboats, barreling out of them without even tying them down. Certain any moment there would be a flash, then nothing but death. They passed a stunned native woman holding her infant child. She had come out of her home to watch the burning ship. The sailors yelled at her to run, which only frightened the woman. Thinking fast, a crewman ran up and snatched the infant from the woman's arms before taking off for the hills for cover. It worked. The woman gave chase. These two would be the only people that the crew of the Mont Blanc managed to save that day. But word of the disaster would get out. Arriving to work later than usual, 40-year-old Commander Evan Wyatt was the CXO of the entire port of Halifax. Of the few people that knew about the nature of the Mont Blanc's cargo, he was one of them. 
So upon arriving at his place of work at Pier 9 and seeing the vessel on fire, he immediately began efforts to get the word out to minimize the damage of the impending explosion. A few blocks away at the local rail yard was train dispatcher Vincent Coleman and his associate William Lovett. Lovett was finishing his night watch and discussing what was happening in the harbor right now. As they were talking, a sailor of the Royal Canadian Navy came running into the office, red-faced and out of breath. Boys, you've got to get out of here. Run for it, right now. There's been a bad accident. A French munition ship is on fire. The crew have abandoned her and she's adrift. She's up against Pier 6 and it's going to blow sky high any second. Coleman and Lovett looked at each other in shock before quickly grabbing their coats. Lovett grabbed the telephone and quickly informed the terminal agent. That done, they both moved to the door. Only Coleman stopped and turned back to his desk. He remembered that the number 9 train from St. John was due in at any moment. The overnighter had nearly 300 people on board and would be stopping right next to Pier 6. Lovett turned to inquire what Coleman was doing. He told him he'd be right behind him and he had something to do real fast. He tapped away at the telegraph, sending one warning message over the key. Hold up the train. Ammunition ship afire in harbor, making for Pier 6, and will explode. Guess this will be my last message. Goodbye, boys. The clock struck 9.04. The Mont Blanc was burning from stem to stern. Fire crews on land battled in vain to extinguish the blaze in front of a growing crowd. Many Haligonians watched from their windows. A few boats in the harbor attempted to fight the fire or tow the ship away from shore. In an instant, that all ended. The cargo hold carrying its cargo of TNT and picric acid reached a temperature of 572 degrees Fahrenheit, igniting the picric acid followed by the TNT. The thin metal skin of the hold held the explosion in long enough for the entirety of the load to ignite. In one fifteenth of a second, the entire cargo detonated, heating the epicenter up to 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The blast wave turned the hull of the ship into a makeshift fragmentation grenade sending out shrapnel at 3,400 miles per hour, four times the speed of sound. Instantly, the water surrounding the ship, as well as the people fighting the fire, were vaporized. The ship was immediately reduced to unrecognizable shrapnel, the largest surviving pieces being the shank from one of the anchors, which was found in the woods four miles away, and the barrel to one of the two deck guns, which landed three miles away, the barrel drooping like a half-melted candle. The detonation sent a shockwave into the bedrock beneath the bay at 13,000 miles per hour. An early seismograph 250 miles away at Dalhouse University detecting it. Projectiles from the explosion perforated everything in reach of the Mont Blanc. Shops, building, people, even the nearby IMO received massive amounts of shrapnel. After the explosion came a massive pressure wave. The pressure generated was 14.7 pounds per square inch. This is roughly the pressure experienced by the Titanic's wreck, 2.5 miles underneath the ocean. The pressure wave threw bodies about like rag dolls, some landing half a mile away. The mostly wooden buildings were blown down like stacks of cards. People standing, watching the fire from the safety of their homes, were suddenly blinded as their windows burst inwards, showering them with missiles of broken glass. The vaporization of the water around the Mont Blanc and the massive pressure wave created one last vessel of death, a massive tsunami 20 to 30 feet high that raced out in all directions around the harbor, surging ashore and running down streets and through the town, injured, dying, and dead suddenly swept up by the icy cold water from the harbor and swept away, many ending up in the harbor to drown. After the violent explosion, almost every building in a two mile radius of the Mont Blanc was gone, reduced to mere foundations and piles of splintered timbers. 12,000 buildings damaged in total. Instantly, 1,600 people were either killed or not far from death's door. The IMO was picked up by the massive tsunami and dropped onto the Dartmouth shore. All but one on board died. As for the crew of the Mont Blanc, hiding in the Dartmouth hills, all but one of their crew survived, an unlucky sailor being struck by a piece of shrapnel and bleeding to death before they could get him to a doctor. On the Stella Marais, the tug attempting to aid the Mont Blanc, 21 of her 26-man crew were killed. A massive mushroom cloud sent debris and unburnt benzol miles into the air, all of which started to fall back to earth like greasy black rain. The aftermath of the explosion was the perfect storm. It was morning in Halifax. Families were just starting their day, cooking breakfast on wood-burning stoves. When the mostly wooden buildings were flattened, burning stoves and oil lamps started fires all over town that quickly began to spread. People pinned under downed timbers 
could do nothing as the fires burned them alive. Confusion spread faster than the fires, many wondering just what had happened, those who didn't know about the fire, their homes simply being demolished around them. Rumors spread quickly that it was an attack from the Germans, and more would likely come soon after. Near the piers by the water was the Wellington Barracks. The barracks had been hit hard by the explosion. Many were injured, but this was hardly unique. What was unique was that the barracks had its own magazine, well-stocked and full of ammunition. Nearby lay a furnace for heating the barracks, the explosion spreading hot embers and coals all about. Acting quickly, a lieutenant by the name of C.A. McClellan grabbed an extinguisher and doused the embers, possibly saving countless more lives. But it was a double-edged sword. Dousing the embers caused a massive plume of smoke to be produced. Many saw the plume of smoke from the armory, fingering it to be a flame as well. The word was spread that another explosion was imminent, and told others to head for the hills. Rescue efforts were halted mid-rescue as rescuers headed for safety, fearful of another explosion. Many were left trapped before spreading flames as their rescuers fled for their lives. All in all, thousands were killed in the blast, around 500 of which were children. A great many more were injured and even more left homeless or without sufficient shelter. As many as 5,000 of those injured received eye injuries, largely from shattered glass. Triage centers were established all over the city as medical professionals did everything they could to stem the storm of injured Haligonians. To make matters worse, winter struck with full force the next day. Snow fell all across the city, around a foot and a half of snow in total, covering those without homes, hampering rescue efforts, and burying survivors still trapped. But rescue efforts began nearly immediately after the blast, from police officers, firefighters, military personnel, and even just normal everyday Haligonians. Sailors from the ships moored in the harbor rowed ashore to aid in efforts. Parties came from the HMS High Flyer, HMS Changanola, HMS Knight Templar, and HMS Calgarian. The crews worked to save trapped survivors even as others fled for fear of the second explosion. Out to sea, the explosion was so powerful it rocked the American Denver-class protected cruiser USS Tacoma, 52 miles away. The ship's company entering general quarters believing they were under attack. Upon spotting the massive mushroom cloud, both USS Tacoma and USS Von Steuben sailed into Halifax and were rendering aid by 2 p.m. Trains began to arrive from all over Atlantic Canada, some from as far out as Amherst, Nova Scotia, and Moncton, New Brunswick, 120 and 160 miles away respectively, more arriving each day after to help transport patients. That very day, Lieutenant Governor McCallum Grant established the Halifax Relief Commission, dedicated to treating patients housing survivors, and paying for funeral costs. The commission would last all the way until 1976 before finally ending, the later years spent paying pensions to relatives of survivors. Due to the large amount of eye-related injuries, the Canadian National Institute for the Blind was established, attempting to aid the thousands with eye injuries. The institute still exists to this day. A judicial inquiry known as the Rec Commissioner's Inquiry was formed to investigate the accident. After a lengthy investigation, the commission attempted to lay blame upon Francis Mackay and Captain Le Medec, saying due to the nature of her cargo, it was the Mont Blanc's sole responsibility to avoid collision, a surprising finding seeing as the IMO was on the incorrect side of the channel. Charges of manslaughter were laid upon the captain and the pilot, but not enough evidence was available to support the charges, and they were subsequently dropped. In the end, the 1917 Halifax explosion maintained a long-standing legacy as the largest man-made explosion until 1945. It still remains one of the largest non-nuclear man-made explosions in history. It was the perfect storm of wrong place, wrong time, with disastrous circumstances that would affect the lives of thousands and leave a lasting mark on an already war-torn world, showing that despite being thousands of miles away from the front, or is still hell and affects everyone in one way or another. Thanks for tuning in for another video. This one has been highly requested and was a very long time coming, but I hope you found it educational. I'd like to thank my patrons on Patreon for sticking it out with me and continuing to support me. That means a lot. If you're looking to support my efforts and don't got the money to do so, that's no sweat. Just like the video, comment if you like, and subscribe if you haven't. You know, the usual YouTuber rigmarole. If you want to support my channel artist, I have links for merch and patches in the description. All the money for that goes to feeding a struggling artist. I've been busy with Merchant Mariner licenses and training, so if you know anything about that, you'll know my struggle. <laughs>
But most of that is over now, and I have a lot of content planned now that I have more time. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, fair winds and following seas, shipmates.